Round one. Hello, Hello guys. Welcome, welcome to, to the Woman's Woman Cave. Cave. Well, Wait, I was a little behind you. Go ahead, Dave. Welcome to the Woman's Cave? Yes, okay. yes. So right. I guess I get to have it today because we both had champagne today, so no at boys. At the beach, at the beach. Okay, I'm I sorry. mean, it's going to rain, like, here for the right. next, like, 14 days, the possibility of rain. So you have to get the good beach time in when you can. Yes. But anyway. I'm Jay. And I'm Winona. And, yeah, right. I almost forgot to introduce us. So Ooh, high five. High five. Distance. Social distance. But we're not even going to do that much banter today. We're going to jump right into, like, our books. And because then, we have a very serious guest. Because we have a serious guest, and she is doing our, Tuesday, our Poetry Tuesdays, which I think might be happening once a month, unless we beg her. Maybe she can do every other week. Mm-hmm. I know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We'll see how the begging goes. No peer pressure. Yes. Pressure. You feel the pressure, though, right? There you go. All right, here we go. We are the author of the And I Thought series of the And I Thought Divorce. Literally, like Jazz of Pop Poetry. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I thought being grown up with Evie, that got a They're, remake, but that's yes. exciting. you got to check out the cover. Both of those things are available on audible.com. We also have the Mystic Eye series. series, and we are the founders of the 25 Hottest Indie Authors, Artists, and Advocates magazine. Please pick this up. It's 196 pages long. And just to give you a sneak peek, we have the president of Harper One in here, Judith Kerr. She actually answers a lot of really cool questions. Uh, and then we have our only, po- well, not one of our only poetry books. books. There's only three Which of is them. If Only I Were Me, available on barnesandnoble.com only. But y'all, are, oh, check out everything you ladies are doing on www.andwethought.com. And y'all are here to hear here. about us. You're here to hear from our wonderful guest. Wonderful guest, would you like to introduce yourself? And start our, ta- our Poetry Tuesday series. Terrific. Thank you so much. It's great to see you both again. My name is Kim Roberts, and um, I, uh, I have a new book. I've been spending a lot of time uh, reading and thinking about poems from the 1800s um, as I prepared this new anthology for publication. Um, the book is called By Broad Potomac's Shore, Great Poems from the Early Days of Our Nation's Capital, and it will be published uh, this coming October from the University of Virginia Press, but it's already available for pre-order. And you can find out more about the book if you are interested at my website, www.kimroberts.org. So let me jump right in. The 1800s are an interesting period to compare with our own. Uh, There was a huge expansion of new communications technologies then, just like there is now. Newspaper and magazine outlets in the second half of the 19th century saw an explosive growth in the number and types of journals, but also in readership numbers. Poetry was included from the start and was responsible in part for many of the journal's popularity. Um, Prior to the the rise of modernism in literature, poetry was not seen as elitist. Everyone read and recited it. Um, Poems, uh, as I said, appeared in newspapers, but also all over the place. Uh, Poems were memorized in schoolrooms. They were regularly used as part of a, a public school curriculum. Poems were set to music and sung in churches and town halls. They were recited at parties, community meetings, in clubs, and at family gatherings. Uh, They were copied into album books and mailed to friends. Uh, The regular meter and rhyme aided in memorization, which only added to their popularity. Uh, Meter and rhyme are, of course, one of the ways that we create pleasure. Uh, in language. And we talked a little bit about this in our our previous podcast. Any kind of repetition of sound, rhythm, word, phrase, registers in our minds as pleasurable. And, oh, that was nice. Thank you. You showed the, that's the the book cover of my my forthcoming book. So we continue to to love meter and rhyme in certain forms, nursery rhymes um, and in music. Um, But most American poets today write in free verse, which has no fixed pattern of meter or rhyme. 
And so as a consequence, uh, the poetry of the 1800s sounds dated to our modern ears. It sounds a little sentimental. It sounds old fashioned. Uh, but I would argue that we need to go back to this time period to understand much of our history. And once we've tuned our ears to the sounds of rhyme and meter, we start to see this timeless pleasure that can be found in the musicality of language. Now, we Americans have always been very practical. We want to find utility in the arts. Um, so that's true in literature too. Uh, we, we want our literature to educate and inform. And because the poetry of the 1800s was so visible in this range of civic forums, it was used as a tool to help define the country and define shared values uh, of its people. So there are poems from this era that, are, era that are unabashedly patriotic or religious. Um, many reflect the rise of political parties and the upheavals that led to the Civil War. Uh, many take on political and social changes in the country. Um, sometimes in really ambitious ways, uh, addressing issues such as abolitionism, women's rights, voting rights, and the temperance movement. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is um, uh, talk about three poets in particular that I uh, feature in my upcoming anthology if that's all right with you. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to do this in honor of the, the recent nationwide Black Lives Matter protests. Um, because I think um, these are, are literary forebears. Uh, I want to look at three poets. They were all born enslaved. They all lived for part of their lives in Washington, DC. Um, their names are Fanny Jackson Coppin, Frederick Douglass, and T. Thomas Fortune. Now, I would bet everybody who's listening has heard of Frederick Douglass, but I'm not so sure they know Fanny Jackson Coppin or T. Thomas Fortune, and they should. All, all well-read Americans should know these, these poets. Um, their poems give us really important insights into the complexity of the lives of people of color in Washington, DC and other cities, uh, especially in the eras um, immediately after emancipation. Um, and because all three were born enslaved, they all three had to overcome really traumatic beginnings. Um, and they rose to become writers of note, uh, writers whose work I love um, and poets who changed and enriched our country's literature. Um, they also provide an inspirational model that helps us to better understand poetry's role in early civil rights efforts, sort of proto-civil rights. Um, so uh, let, let's start with Fanny Jackson Coppin. Um, during and after the Civil War, women of color led efforts to build relief organizations for freed slaves. Many of these organizations were church-based community mutual aid societies. Um, some of their efforts provided freed people with housing, clothing, firewood, food rations. Uh, educational programs, healthcare, and job placement programs were also offered. Um, so F Fanny Jackson Coppin was one of the leaders of these social movements, especially in providing opportunities for equal education. Uh, she was born enslaved in Washington, DC. She was emancipated by an aunt who purchased her freedom at age 12. And I think we might have a, a photo of her uh, that we can show, maybe. <laughs> yeah, let, let's, like, let's hope that it, it does it to me. I'm, 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 te I'm testing your, your oh. technical uh, abilities here. Um, uh, can you see? I cannot. No, no, it's not coming up on my screen. Maybe it's, it's coming up on here. yours. It but is, I'll, keep, so. I'll keep talking. Oh, there she is. There she is. Okay. 
Excellent. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a beautiful picture of her. Thank you. Um, no. She attended Oberlin College, where she opted to take the more academically rigorous uh, pro uh, program, what was then called the Gentleman's Course. Um, which included studies in Latin, Greek, and mathematics. And she distinguished herself as an exceptional scholar. After graduation, Coppin spent 37 years teaching and serving as principal for the Institute for Colored Youth in Philadelphia, which was a forerunner to Cheney University. She was the wife of a minister, and, and so she was active in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and she traveled with her husband to do missionary work in South Africa. And Coppin State University in Baltimore, you may know of, that was named in her honor. So um, I'm going to read a, a poem. It's a, a slightly long, but I, I, it, it's, it's lively. I hope you'll, you'll stick with it. It um, uh, was published in May 1863, so during the Civil War, and it was honoring soldiers of color. Uh, early in the war, African-American workers were brought in to do menial labor supporting the Union troops, cooking, washing, tending to horses, digging graves. But as Coppin argues, people of color had a personal stake in joining the battle lines as soldiers and quickly established themselves as effective frontline troops. So this poem is called The Black Volunteer. We welcome, we welcome our brave volunteers. Fling your caps to the breeze boys and give them three cheers. They have proven their valor by many a scar, but their godlike endurance has been nobler by far. Think you not that their brave hearts grew sick with delay when the battle cry summoned their neighbors away? When their offers were spurned and their voices unheeded, and grim prejudice vaunted their aid was not needed. Till some pious soul full of loyal devotion to whom flesh and muscle were more than a notion, proposed that in order to save their own blood as drawers of water and hewers of wood, they should use their black brothers. But the blacks couldn't see what, a, what great magnanimity prompted the plea and they scouted the offer as base and inglorious, for they knew that through God they should yet be victorious. But alas for our country, her insolent horde has melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. A, the face of the nation grew ghastly and white when the angel of death crossed her sill in the night, and her firstborn were slain, then she bowed her pr proud head, while in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes she mourned for her dead. Let her weep for her martial pride, weep for her noblest, the southern plains reek with the blood of her boldest. Yet her pride is not humbled by what she has borne. Tis necessity's goad that is urging her on to enlist you, my brothers. Tis natural, we read, to hate whom we've injured by word or by deed. But God's ways are just. His decrees are immutable, though often to us they seem dark and inscrutable. He meant not that slavery always should last, and over his people its dark shadow cast. Now freedom stands holding with uplifted face, her hand dipped in blood on the brow of our race. Attest it, my country, and never again by this holy baptism forget we are men, nor dare when we've mingled our blood in your battles to sneer at our bravery and call us your chattels. Our ancestors fought on your first battle plains and you paid them right nobly with insult and chains. You pitied not even the sad and forlorn. You pensioned their widows and orphans on scorn. In your hour of bitterest trial and need, you have called us once more. To your voice we give heed. No longer your treacherous faith, faith will discuss, but let God be the witness between you and us. We have start, stout hearts among us as well do you know that never quailed before danger or shrank from a foe. 
They have come at your bidding in dangers to share and that which is grander to do and to dare. Then away to the battlefield, brave volunteers will not sadden your parting with womanish tears. Fling out to the breezes your banner of right and under its broad folds assemble your might. Go liberty, honor, a all things most dear are entrusted to you to defend and to clear from the stain of oppression whose poisonous breath is less welcome to us than the black wing of death. Though millions assail ye, yet fear not their might. They shall vanish like mist in the sun's ruddy light, for God will go with you. His word has been spoken, his gleaming blade never in battle was broken. With him as your leader, your cause will fail never. Sic iter ad astra, your watchword forever. So in that, that final line, Coton, Coppin is quoting a, a Latin phrase from Virgil's Aeneid, sic iter ad astra, which translates as that's the path to the stars. Um, Coppin believed strongly in African-American self-help and African-American self-determination. And she stakes her claim in that poem with what sh should have been obvious to white people, the ability of people of color to take an active leadership role in their own freedom. I, I love especially the, the lines, um, uh, uh, never again by this holy baptism, forget we are men, nor dare when we've mingled our blood in your battles to sneer at our bravery and call us your chattels. It's just very powerful writing. And I think that the meter also helps sort of, you, 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 get, you get pulled in to the meter uh, with that. So that's, that's the first point that I wanted to share. Fabulous. I mean, honestly, I, there's not much I mean, what, what other questions her going to can school. I have? I was like, I'm, I'm going to school. I'm taking notes. That's, that's <laughs> what I'm doing. So I'm excited to be educated on my own show. Professor Roberts, you can't uh, <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll just jump right ahead. So the second poet, oh. yeah, the second poet is Frederick Douglass. Um, and um, m many of us are, are more familiar with him. He became the first African-American to have a formal meeting with the U.S. president inside the White House when he met with Abraham Lincoln in July 1863 to discuss the treatment of African-American Union Army soldiers. Uh, Douglas was born enslaved in Maryland, and he became one of the most renowned orators of the 19th century. He wrote three notable autobiographies, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, My Bondage and My Freedom, and The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. And I think we might be coming up with his picture, right? oh, maybe. That's you to leave it. I was oh, like, leave it, leave oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry. Until she says picture. Oh, no, 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 oh, I, just, I didn't see it. So it came up on your side. That's, that's fine. Oh, okay. wait, 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 I can get it back. Okay, I promise. <laughs> no, 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 we're good. Um, so where was I? Oh, so he edited um, abolitionist newspapers, including the North Star and New National Era. And he served in several government posts uh, as U.S. <laughs> Marshal, D.C. Recorder of Deeds, and Consul General to the Republic of Haiti. Are you seeing it on your <laughs> side? And I'm just not seeing it on my, oh, there we go. Hooray. <laughs> There he is. There he I love that photo. Um, so. so his best known poem, uh, a parody, follows the form of a Christian hymn. Uh, it was included at the end of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. And in this poem, he uses religious language and religious imagery to point out the detestable irony of using the Bible to justify slavery. Um, so this also is a, a somewhat longer poem, but it's in meter, which will help sort of keep things rolling. Um, and it's got a, um, a, a great use of a, a refrain line. So this is a parody. You ready? We're ready. <laughs> okay. 
Come saints and sinners, hear me tell how pious priests whip Jack and Nell and women buy and children sell and preach all sinners down to hell and sing of heavenly union. They'll bleat and baw, dona like goats, gorge down black sheep and strain at moats, array their backs in fine black coats, then seize their Negroes by their throats and choke for heavenly union. They'll church you if you sip a dram and damn you if you steal a lamb, yet rob old Tony, Doll, and Sam of human rights and bread and ham, kidnappers heavenly union. They'll loudly talk of Christ's reward and bind his image with a cord and scold and swing the lash of hoard and sell their brother in the Lord to handcuffed heavenly union. They'll read and sing a sacred song and make a prayer both loud and long and teach the right and do the wrong, hailing the brother sister throng with words of heavenly union. We wonder how such saints can sing or praise the Lord upon the wing who roar and scold and whip and sting and to their slaves and mammon cling in guilty conscience union. They'll raise tobacco, corn, and rye, and drive, and thieve, and cheat, and lie, and lay up treasures in the sky by making switch and cowskin fly in hope of heavenly union. They'll crack old Tony on the skull and preach and roar like bash and bull or braying ass of, of mischief full, then seize old Jacob by the wool and pull for heavenly union. A roaring, ranting, sleek man thief who lived on mutton, veal, and beef, yet never would afford, uh, afford relief to needy, sable sons of grief was big with heavenly union. Love not the world, the preacher said, and winked his eye and shook his head and seized on Tom and Dick and Ned, cut short their meat and clothes and bread, yet still loved heavenly union. Another preacher whining spoke of one whose heart for sinners broke. He tied old nanny to an oak and drew the blood at every stroke and prayed for heavenly union. Two others oped their iron jaws and waved their children's stealing paws. There sat their children in goo by stinting Negroes' backs and maws. They kept up heavenly union. All good from Jack, another takes, and entertains their flirts and rakes, who dress as sleek as glossy snakes and cram their mouths with sweetened cakes. And this goes down for union. <sighs> The, uh, uh, the use of that, that sort of sing-songy rhythm really works in tension with how intense the, the, the content is of that poem. I, I, it's just, um, it's sort of amazing to read out loud. Yeah, and, and you did a great rendition. Yes, it did. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, not, not that my voice in any way was like his. Um, I was reminded recently of a, a, a quote by Frederick Douglass that I think speaks to our own times convincingly and really supports the Black Lives Matter protests. He said, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. Um, the third poet that I want to discuss uh, is T. Thomas Fortune, uh, who would become best known as the editor of the New York Age, uh, the leading African-American newspaper in the US from the 1880s to the early 1900s. Uh, he got his start in DC attending Howard University, although he never graduated. Um, but he also took his first uh, report, job as a reporter in DC at a newspaper called The People's Advocate. Um, I see that you are uh, looking to put up his picture. 
Can you see it on your side? There we go. There he is. Yay! Yay you got it right. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, T. Thomas Fortune co-founded the National Afro-American League, a precursor to the Niagara Movement, which was a precursor to the NAACP. And he edited the influential weekly Negro World. His books include Black and White, Land, Labor, and Politics in the South, the kind of education the Afro-American most needs, and Dreams of Life, miscellaneous poems. Uh, Fortune was active in Republican Party politics and a longtime advisor to Booker T. Washington. Uh, I think his importance as a leader in Reconstruction America cannot be overstated. He was born enslaved in Florida. Um, his writing helped lay the foundations for the modern civil rights movement. And I'm going to read a, another poem that, that focuses on violence, as, as the other two uh, that I, I read did. Um, this, this is a poem that celebrates Nat Turner, who led a rebellion of enslaved people in Southampton County, Virginia, in August 1831. Turner was literate, a deeply religious lay minister and a natural leader. And although the rebellion was suppressed after a few days, the group of approximately 70 fighters traveled from house to house, freeing enslaved people and killing uh, about 60 white people. The, the numbers are a little um, inexact. Um, he used revolutionary violence to awaken whites to the brutality of slaveholding and the subsequent white retaliation inflamed the national debate about slavery and brought the controversial subject of African-American self-emancipation into the national discussion. And I would argue also hastened the onset of the, the Civil War. So this is T. Thomas Fortune uh, writing about Nat Turner. I'm gonna take a quick sip. Okay, ah, Nat Turner. <laughs> hmm. He stood erect, a man as proud as ever to a tyrant bowed on willing head or bent a knee and longed while bending to be free. And o'er his ebon features came a shadow. Twas of manly shame, a Shame that he should wear a chain and feel his manhood writhed with pain, doomed to a life of plodding toil, shamefully rooted to the soil. He stood erect, his eyes flashed fire, his robust form convulsed with ire. I will be free, I will be free, or fighting die a man, cried he. Virginia's hills were lit at night, the slave had risen in his might, and far and near, Nat's wail went forth to south and east and west and north, and strong men trembled in their power, and weak men felt twas now their hour. I will be free, I will be free, or fighting die a man, cried he. The tyrant's arm was all too strong, had swayed dominion all too long, and so the hero met his end, as all who fall as freedom's friend. The blow he struck shook slavery's throne. His cause was just, even skeptics own. And round his lowly grave soon swarmed freedom's brave hosts for freedom armed. That host was swollen by Nat's kin to fight for freedom, freedom win, Upon the soil that spurned his cry, I will be free or I will die. Let tyrants quake, even in their power, for sure will come the awful hour when they must give an answer why heroes in chains should basely die instead of rushing to the field and counting battle ere they yield. Powerful words. Yes. That's yeah. very powerful. Very powerful. Yes. Wow. I'm still thinking about that. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> I told you we, we came to learn today. Yeah, pretty much. We, yeah. I came to learn. <laughs> we were like, we're going to actually, we're going to learn, for, and we're going to sit in class and be quiet and learn. 
the moon. Yeah, well, I, I do, I, I think that, um, I mean, you know, I'm a historian, so of course I look to history, but I, I, I do think that um, reading these forebears is really important in grounding us in the civil rights struggles that we're currently in. Um, I, I, I think um, we need this literature. Um, and of course, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is in the process of creating its own powerful, moving contributions to American literature, and that's going to continue. Um, so maybe I should end by uh, naming some names of contemporary poets who I would like to recommend that people, uh, 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 whose work I, I think uh, people should read um, that relates directly to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, I'd recommend in particular um, Jericho Brown, Ross Gay, Claudia Rankin, Denez Smith, Kyle Dargan, Reginald Dwayne Betts and Nikki Finney. That's just a, a short list, but those are all writers whose work I love. Um, Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing. So Thank now you. I have more to read when I go back. <laughs> I know, right? It's fabulous because I've never ordered so many books in my life. And I've been a like almost lifelong reader. And I, since I have so much time, I get to order so many books and, and read them. And read them. Well, and this, I'd be like this, it, yeah. in the morning trying to get some pages in. This is a good time right now. Um, I, I, you know, we should all be um, uh, ordering our books from independent booksellers, especially. Well, can you please tell everyone that, um, that that website so that we can order so our, people can order those books that you recommended from that website? The, the website oh, that yeah, yeah. Them? Um, well, all right, so, so my website um, where you can uh, order my anthology is just my name. It's, it's um, www.kimroberts.org. Um, and Kim Roberts is spelled exactly how you, you think it is. Um, but um, for, for books, booksellers that um, uh, would carry some other contemporary poetry books, um, uh, what I would suggest that you do is uh, just do a little research in whatever community you're in for um, uh, bookstores that are uh, run by African American booksellers. Um, so, you know, I know uh, here in DC, um, loyalty bookstores um, would be a good one to, to order from. Um, but I think that this, this information is pretty, pretty easy to, to find online. Um, uh, if you Google black owned bookstores um, and, and then um, look for their uh, poetry recommendations, um, you know, this will this, be, be there. Yeah, this, this is the time to, to be supporting those businesses and, and also, um, uh, you know, supporting those writers who uh, are doing this really crucial work of capturing this moment in history, this political moment. Well, we thank you very much for coming on. We always love having you on. We always learn something. Oh, I like to call you, in my mind, the historian, Kim Roberts, but that's just in my mind. That's, <laughs> that's what I call you in my mind. Oh, well, I just want to say that the poems that, that you gave today were very hard-hitting and, and thoughtful, and I have something to think about for the rest of my week. I know, right? right? Something to read, maybe, like, uh, look it up on Google, read some more. I'm super yeah. excited for it. And, and then it's all, it's all else, uh, do some comparative literature. Oh, yeah, why not? Yeah. Because we have all the time. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Roberts, for coming on today. And I We will, hope you come back. Yes, we do, because, you know, we always love to learn on this show. That's what we do. Well, well thank, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I know that was a lot of talking at you, but, but <laughs> um, you know, obviously this is, uh, these are poems that I, I feel really passionately about. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share them. Absolutely. Are you joking? Like, I learned so much today. Thank you so much. And you can find out everything your ladies are doing on www.andwethought.com. Dot com. While you're there, take a moment, go to the Ladies tab, and go down to the charities that we probably support. Yes, we know that times are tight. So if you have some extra things like clothes, if you were doing that 
spring clean out, you have some extra clothes, and you think about donating, maybe to donate to one of them, or just go on their website and just say, I see the work that you're doing, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you for doing it. Who doesn't need a little encouragement every now and again? So we thank you in advance, and just remember that wisdom is all around you. Yes. You're open to finding it and accepting it. So peace and love, you guys, from Winona and Jade. Back to the beach time.